Hello everyone, I'm Chris Corvetti. I'm a rain barrel specialist here in the Bay Area and I'm super excited to talk to you guys about rainwater harvesting. So I guess the big question that we're all here to answer is why harvest rainwater? And usually in an in-person presentation I would pose this question to you guys and hope to get some of these answers back. Fortunately in a webinar you guys just get my voice so we're going to look at some of the obvious reasons, you know, we save water because we're going to be using some of that rainwater again rather than using municipal water. So it's going to lower your water bill. It also helps with moisture around your building because it's taking some of that water that would have gone straight around your building and holding it for a period before using it in a drier season. They can be really, really gorgeous. So you can do a rain garden that really adds aesthetic value to your home. It requires less maintenance than a lot of basic irrigation systems. A lot of rain gardens, we're gonna talk about how they're a little bit less maintenance when you use native plants. It gives you a connection to nature because with those native plants, you're gonna have hummingbirds, you're gonna have butterflies, uh, maybe some nice local bees coming around to say hello and just really, really pretty connection to nature right in your own front yard. Uh, it can prevent erosion and local flooding um, in certain areas, depending on the type of soil you have, it can replenish groundwater. Um, in, in your home, it may not be a real concern depending on where your groundwater level is or your soil type. So that might not be one of your biggest concerns. But one of the ones we really wanna look at today is it can reduce polluted runoff from stormwater. And that's a really important one. And that ties right into improving the water quality in the creek. It can also give your plant, make your plants a little bit healthier since the rainwater doesn't have that same treatment as the municipal water. It's not as chlorinated. So some of our stormwater pollution sources in the Bay Area and in any urban area, really, you're looking at oil from restaurants. They get put out back to before they can go through the process to be recycled and a lot of times those containers can leak and end up getting out into the pavement that will then get washed into a storm drain. Uh, when you have building supplies for construction sites, you'll have concrete. You can see in this picture on the right, you can see concrete powder kind of flowing down towards the storm drain and it gets in our roads. We know when we drive through, we'll see a lot of construction materials kind of on the road on the side of our highways. And while we're driving, we also might have some oil leaking from our cars, maybe a little bit of rust, some brake dust if we brake really hard. And all of that kind of flakes out onto the road. And then when we get a big wash of rain, that's gonna flush it into our storm drains. Uh, right now, a lot of us are dealing with ash from these forest fires. So that's something you, you see a lot of. And, if you think about a couple weeks ago, we all came out of our houses and saw a layer of ash on our vehicles. All of that ash is, you know, sitting on the ground. A lot of that ash isn't just from wood, it's from homes, it's from, you know, different chemicals that are used in the homes. And that ash sits there and that's gonna get washed into the storm drains. Um, you can see a car wash in this picture in the bottom left. And a lot of, um, car washes in this area do capture and recycle their water, but not all of them. And so you really want to be mindful, especially, you know, we can't wash our cars in our own driveway because that'll run right into the road and the soap really affects the fish in the creeks. Um, we want to, same thing with overwatering our landscape, uh, keeping an eye out for broken sprinklers because all of that adds extra water to flush all of those pollutants down towards our storm drains. Um, pet waste, I have a dog and I have friends who have cats and a lot of people think about dog waste and they pick up their dog waste, but not a lot of people think about cats and cat waste. Um, right now, a big issue down in Monterey is that sea otters are starting to get a type of brain cancer that's caused from the different bacteria that's found in cat waste. So we're starting to think about cat, outdoor cats as well as dogs. Um, just basic plastic and garbage that we see every day on the side of the roads. All of that kind of goes into our storm drains. So let's talk a little bit about storm drains. So we have another poll for you guys. What happens when water flows through a gutter 
and down a storm drain. Pretty much all of you guys close indoor creeks and straight into the bay untreated. So we're gonna take a look at that and then we're gonna talk about some of the solutions. Our sanitary sewer does that, one of those options on the questionnaire was it flows through a sanitary sewer into a treatment plant. That is what happens from our toilets, our dishwashers, our laundry machines, our everything in our house goes out into the sewer and it goes to the water quality control plant in Palo Alto where it gets treated before it goes back out into nature. Everything gets treated and the water is all clean, cleaned up before it goes out. But everything that goes into that storm drain goes straight into the storm drain directly into our creeks and then flows down the creeks and straight into the bay. And that's really concerning because we just talked about all these different things that could possibly be in that water. So if we look at that storm water, we look at a roof, it comes off the roof and all of these hard surfaces, the roof, the street, all of those surfaces are things that aren't here naturally. They are, they're man-made. So those are hard surfaces where the water probably would have at one point just sunk straight into the ground and it wouldn't have been an issue. But in urban areas, we have parking lots, we have streets, we have houses, and all of that is a non-permeal surface. It all sits on that and runs off. So then we hits our lawn or our landscape and it can pick up maybe some fertilizer or some pesticides or some pet waste. And then it flows out into the road where it picks up that brake dust and that, you know, the ash we talked about from the forest fires, the motor oil, and then it runs down into our st storm drain. So all of that combines to make not the healthiest environment for our fish in our creeks and for the rest of the bay and heading out into the ocean. All of those animals really need that clean water and it's, it's being polluted. So there's some really great solutions that we're looking at now, especially in Palo Alto. Um, and some of that's called green stormwater infrastructure. And green infrastructure is stuff that we're gonna talk about today, such as rain barrels, rain gardens, cisterns, pervious pavement, but also things like green roofs, which you're gonna see, you know, maybe not the best option for your home, but really a great option for some of the more public buildings. Um, you're gonna see larger scale public things, especially in Palo Alto, you'll see these curb cuts, which you can see in, in both the upper right and the lower left picture. You can see a cuts in the curb where the water can flow into a green area that's sunken. So all that street water goes into a green area and that slows down that water so it has a chance to sink into the ground before going to a storm drain. So there's a lot of different infrastructure that the city is doing now to make the city actually account for all of the more um, commercial locations. But we're gonna talk about some of the stuff that you can do right at your own home. So, we're gonna talk about some rain barrels and there's a lot of different types of barrels. This one in the top corner is kind of a non-standard barrel. It's called a raindrop box slim line. And it's very, very low profile. So you can put it in a smaller area if you don't have room for a bigger, bigger barrel. We're gonna talk about some rain gardens. This garden here is at Hoover Park in Palo Alto and it's right around a storm drain. You can see that in the middle and that actually slows the water before it hits that storm drain so a lot more water goes into the ground. And we're going to talk about some cisterns, which are a larger form of a rain barrel. When you get over 200 gallons, we consider it a cistern. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. And we're going to talk about pervious pavement. So I'm going to actually start with that last one. And if you take a look at this picture in the bottom right, you can see this is actually a driveway. There's a car parked in the driveway. You can see those back tires. And I bet in your neighborhood, you've seen a lot of driveways like, like this. This one is slabs of concrete with grass in between. So when the water hits that concrete, it flows into one of those areas of grass and is able to actually soak into the ground. And sometimes you'll see it with stones or river rocks. And sometimes you'll see it in this case with grass. And we're gonna kind of break down what it takes for that to be a pervious pavement. And that's kind of the most common type that I see in my neighborhood. Uh, people have been doing them for a long time. 
And it basically how it works in this bottom left picture, they have that pervious pavement, or in this case, it's actually non pervious concrete with gaps in it so that you have that grass coming in. But underneath you have a couple layers of bedding and base and sub base and those are all designed to help that water be able to sink in rather than run off onto the road. And you might need a drain, you might not, depending on your type of soil. So you can kind of see this diagram how that works. I'm not going to talk a lot about pervious pavement because we didn't really come here for that today, but I think it's really a cool idea. And they've actually invented this really awesome one. The second picture on the bottom is porous cement. And if you look, you can see a hose is pouring directly onto a slab of cement and that water is coming straight through it underneath. And this porous cement is being used now at a lot of parks and you can see Mitchell Park in this top right picture. All of the parking spaces have this permeable asphalt parking. So anywhere where cars are parked, if you know you spill your bottle of water on it, you'll see it soak right into the ground rather than flow off down the road to the storm drain. And when it rains, it has that same effect. It just soaks right through into the ground. And Mitchell Park is designed the same way in this how it works picture, where you can see the um, pervious pavement on top. And then, there we go. And then the water really soaks slowly through the base and the bedding and the sub base. And it goes right into the ground rather than hitting those storm drains. And all those layers will trap any of those pollutants we talked about aren't going to run through those layers. So they'll kind of get trapped in it. And that will help filter the water. So by the time the water hits that drain, that water's actually been cleaned quite a bit by nature. So this picture on the left is the native rain garden installed in Bull Park in Palo Alto a few years ago. And you can see it's grown up quite a bit in the last few years and it's looking pretty healthy. And it's actually right next to a community native rain garden that has been there for many, many years. And this was just extending it down all the way to the bike path. So this one actually captures water off the bike path. So the bike path no longer floods because flooding was a bit of an issue there. And the main idea for rain garden is to slow it, spread it and sink it. And I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard that expression, slow it, spread it, sink it. And it really is exactly what it sounds like. You want to slow that water down. You want to kind of spread it out and you want to sink it into the ground. And all of that is to keep it from going down our storm drains with all of those pollutants that we learned about that are on those hard surfaces. Um, when you have a rain garden, especially if you use native plants, you really don't need as much irrigation because native plants are adapted to have a lot of water in the rainy season and not need much water in the dry season. And because you have water from the street set up to kind of flow into it or water from your house or water from your rain barrels set to flow into this rain garden, you don't need to water it very much at all. And so it really reduces your irrigation issues. Um, as we said, it slows it, spreads it and sink it. So it reduces that flooding, it reduces sewer overflows and erosion and really can be very gorgeous. It'll enhance your landscape. Again, butterflies, and all sorts of wonderful wildlife. Uh, native plants are very low maintenance. You trim them back a little bit once a year. They're extremely low maintenance. My entire front yard, I work on maybe twice a year and it looks great. Um, there's a Valley Water Qualifying Plant List, which is gonna be included in our follow-up email, which will tell you which plants you need to use to qualify for the rain garden rebate and which plants they really recommend to, to use that less irrigation and, and really save our potable water. So we're gonna take a look at the anatomy of a traditional rain garden. This is you know, a very traditional rain garden, maybe not what you'll do at your own home, but you have that water starting at the top here and it's coming off of you know, a house, a sidewalk, a driveway, a parking lot, it might come off of a sloping hillside or you might have your rain barrel overflowing into this. There are so many different sources you can use for your rain garden. 
Um, I on the top really like to use river rocks because it gives it that kind of dry creek bed look when there is no water, which I find aesthetically pleasing. You might have something different that you like for your own home. Underneath uh, traditionally is used a bioswale soil, which is a mix of compost and aggregate or sand. So you have a compost and sand mixture and that really allows you to, to get that water to really soak through. And then in the bottom, you have that drainage rock, which again, is gonna allow that water to soak down into the ground. So you'll get a temporary ponding while it's raining or while you have water flowing into this rain garden, but it's gonna be more of a dry creek bed for most of the year. If you use mulch on your raised berms, it really helps to keep that moisture in the soil. I really like mulch in any garden. Um, you can also do something called sheet mulching where you put down cardboard first and then the mulch and that cardboard acts as another insulating layer to keep that moisture in the ground. Um, and if you, if you combine this with a rain barrel, you get a really efficient system. Uh, you know, for your home, you're, you really want to take a look at those uh, rebate requirements for Palo Alto. And some of them are listed here in this diagram. And we're going to talk about them a little bit more at the end. And this is kind of what a rain garden looks like if it's coming right off your house. You can see the water coming down your downspout and flowing into your rain garden. And you're going to have, you know, six to 12 inch of a ponding depth here. And we're gonna talk a little bit more, Pam is an expert on all the rebate requirements for Palo Alto. So we're gonna talk about those at the end of the presentation. But one of the things that everybody always asks me, is there really enough rain for it to be worth it? We live in the Bay Area, we don't get much rain. So the answer simply is yes, absolutely. Um, if you have a thousand square foot area, you're going to capture over 600 gallons of water in a one inch storm. And here's an equation so you can calculate your harvesting potential. On the right, you can see two pictures. This is actually the same site. The top picture is during the dry season. You can see it looks like a dry creek bed. The bottom picture is during a rain event. And you can see it's just totally filled and it can't even handle that much water because there's just so much water coming down. And even in our average storms, which are about half an inch, you really get a lot. So here's the equation again. And if you have a paper and pen, you can go ahead and enter in your own roof size and the amount of rain you want to calculate for and figure out how much you want for yours. And so I'm going to do everything at a thousand square feet. And an average event here is about half an inch. And that with that conversion factor of 0.62 gallons per inch square foot, you get about 310 gallons for a half an inch of rain. But in Palo Alto, we only get about 17 inches of rain per year. And that totals for a thousand square foot roof, about 10,540 gallons of water. So that's more water than you're going to be able to capture. Unfortunately, we are going to have to let some of it, you know, continue down onto our landscape and onto our driveways, but we can get a lot of that out of the system and really, really capture it and get it sunk into the ground. Susie, did I see a couple questions popping up? Yes, ma'am. Um, these are both related to previous pavement. Oh, I'm um, sorry. That either yeah, but either you or, or Pam, please chime in with the answers here. Both are from Rich, and the first one is, we have fairly light and moderate rainfall here in Palo Alto. Does pervious payment work with heavy rain? Pam, do you want to take that one on? Sure. sure. So as Chris mentioned, the average rainfall in Palo Alto is around five inches, and, and it's about that in... San Mateo County and as you go south it even decreases. So this the Perfia pavement systems, whatever they are, are definitely able to capture half an inch an hour and can capture even up to two inches per hour in the East Coast in certain projects. So that is not an issue. Um, and I noticed another question if you could yeah. ask that too, Susan. Yes. 
Um, are there complications if pervious pavement freezes? So pervious pavement systems actually have been found to store heat underneath them. So they tend to help thaw ice and snow that falls on them. And they've also been known to require less road salt. So which um, is a great benefit to water quality since um, chlorides from salt have impacts a lot of the Great Lakes and other areas in the Midwest. All right, and we just had one more pervious pavement question pop in just now, thought I would share that. If we use pervious pavers next to our house, our house already has water problems in the crawl space. With water sinking into the ground, will it be advisable to use pervious pavers? Well, I would say that it'd be best to talk to a licensed contractor about that. I would say my, just in my uh, less experienced opinion about that, that what I have heard about these type of installations is that if you uh, put impermeable barrier between the pervious pavement and the home, that it, it should be fine. But I would definitely ask a licensed contractor and you are required to have a licensed contractor install your pervious pavement through our the city of Palo Alto's stormwater rebate program. So you would need to talk to a licensed contractor anyway. Great. That Thanks, is Kim. actually a wonderful lead in question to our next topic, unless we have another permeable pavement question. We actually have a rain garden question. I'm going to pivot. Oh, 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 go <laughs> the rain garden question from Chris If most of the runoff from my roof already sinks into my yard, does rain garden provide additional benefits? It does. So depending on the, the layout of your yard, um, you might be able to get 100% of that rainfall to go into a rain garden because you would dig out that swale and you would actually capture all that water rather than just most of it. Also, if you, if you take a look at the native plants, I, I'm not sure exactly what you have in your garden now, but you might find with native plants or the plants that are on that approved list, you might find that your irrigation needs in the dry season and in the summer actually lessen. So you, you might save some money on watering and you might find that you get more butterflies or native, you know, fun little critters, uh, butterflies, hummingbirds to come visit your garden. Great. We can continue on and take a different break later on for more questions. Great. I'm going to go back to that previous question that was asking that they, they already have some water issues in their crawl space and uh, wondering about that permeal pavement. And Pam did a great job answering that. But what I, when I hear that, I go, oh, you know what the perfect solution for you is? It's a rain barrel. So rain barrels are a great way to grab, you know, that first 50, 100, 200 gallons of water that come off your roof. And then that is, you know, 50, 100, 200 gallons of water that is no longer has the option of going into your crawl space. So it actually is, is making less water from your roof going into your landscaping during a heavy event. And then you can store that water and use it later for your garden or your landscaping. And that way it goes into the ground when the ground is dry and not when it's totally saturated. So it'll be less likely to find its way into your crawl space. So there's my, my little transition. Thank you for that question. Um, it also decreases the need for irrigating with municipal water because you're gonna be holding some of that water to use during the dry season. Um, we already talked about reduce the flooding for that same reason and reduce moisture around your building. It improves your water quality in creeks for all those reasons we already talked about. And it's really great. I found that, you know, neighbors will come over and strike up conversation. Well, before COVID, with COVID now, it's not much of neighbors coming over. But it's great because you can strike up conversation and really talk about your rain barrels and how you use them. Some of them can be really attractive. This is an adapted wine barrel at Gamble Gardens. You can see it totally fits in with their landscaping and just looks very attractive and rustic in that location. So we're gonna talk about the anatomy of a rain barrel. And the best picture I have for this is actually a cistern. So this 
picture in the middle is a 265 gallon rain cistern. And we will talk a little bit more about cisterns later. But in this case, it is set up exactly the same way you would set up a rain barrel. And it is a really nice picture because it's bigger, I can really show off all the different parts and pieces. So we're gonna kind of travel the way the rain travels. So we got rain hitting our roof here at the top. Uh, we got our rain coming down in, and that's our downspout right there. After that downspout, it is hitting something called a leaf eater, which we're going to talk about when we talk about accessories. And that leaf eater screens the water so that any leaves, because it's a leaf eater, any leaves or debris get caught on that, and then it gets cleaned off easily. From there, it flows into our tank all the way in. And then we get, you know, a water level in the tank. Um, it's probably not swarmy, so it's probably a pretty flat water level. And when we want to figure out how much water we have in that tank, we can look at this depth gauge, which is also another accessory. Just like, you know, clothing, you can accessorize your rain barrel, so you don't need all of these options. These are just options you can have on a barrel. This barrel happens to have quite a few of them. And that depth gauge, you can see here, it's actually saying that our barrel is full from that green arrow. And when that barrel gets totally full, it will overflow and the water will come out this overflow. And this overflow runs all the way down and then out to a garden in this case. So on this overflow in the second picture on the left hand side, you can see there's also a piece of screening. And that piece of screening is required. We really want to make sure that we can't get any mosquitoes into our rain barrel. So we use that screening to keep anything out. And it also helps if any little debris comes in through the first screen, it'll kind of get stuck and not come out where we don't want it to. Um, it's really, in my opinion, important to earthquake proof any system you have, especially if you have small kids that like to climb on things. So we use metal strapping, and in this case, it's strapped to a fence, and you can see that strapping is in four spots strapped to the fence here. And then at the bottom, you can see a hose curled up. And next to that hose, we have the output. And in this case, we have something called a split output. So we have a lever here that turns the water coming out of the rain barrel on or off. And if we bring the water this way and turn this one on as well, it runs into our hose and we can water anything we need with the hose. There's no pump on this particular system. It's another accessory we're gonna talk about. But in this case, when, especially when the barrel's full, you have all that gravity pressure on 265 gallons of water that's pushing down. So you can actually use that hose for a pretty good distance. This other one goes out to a system to irrigate a rain garden. And this happens to be a pipe that's dug through the ground, underground to a rain garden about 15 feet away. So I don't have a, a good picture of where that pipe's going, but I can turn off the hose and turn on this this one in back and use it to water that. Now that's a very manual system. It's very hands-on. If you want to do anything with it, you have to go turn it off. Some people really don't want to take the time to do that. So the other option is to set up timers like this bottom picture here. And so with this system, all my knobs are left on and I have timers set up to run a two separate drip irrigation systems. And one is going to a little garden on one side and the other one is going to a redwood tree that we are trying to save. And with that system, I also have an additional filter down here. And we're gonna look at that a little bit later on. I have a better close up picture of the filter. And that filter is just because the drip lines have those really fine holes and I don't want any sediment to get into my drip lines to clog them up. But when I'm using a hose like the picture above, you really don't need that extra layer of filter. So as we, we're gonna move forward and talk about each step of this a little bit more and some of our accessories. So 
on that barrel we just looked at, the inflow was a full divert. So that means all of the water from that roof goes into that barrel. It was just an open pipe set above the barrel flowing into it. But there's actually a way that you can, if you have, say, a French drain, you can keep your downspout exactly where it is, not cut it at all, except put a little hole in it, and put one of these systems in this bottom picture in. And this is called a partial diversion. So this is partially diverting the inflow. It does have some of the same requirements. You still need screening, which we talked about. You really don't want those mosquitoes breeding. You don't want those extra pollution pollutants in your system. So you still have to put a screening. And in this case, the screen goes right here. Um, so in this system, the water comes down inside your downspout and it'll get caught in this outer ring and then it'll flow into your rain barrel down this tube that way and then once your rain barrel is filled the water will actually fill up this whole pipe and it'll come out and it'll go up over that little rubber and back down your downspout. And so this one little device takes care of your inflow as well as your overflow. So you don't need to drill another hole in your barrel. This is a really great for a lot of the pre-packaged kits, which we're gonna talk about later, but you can use this for a larger system as well. If you are gonna look at a cistern, I do recommend maybe doing a full divert because you'll capture the water a little bit faster that way. If you are going to have a separate overflow, you really want it high on the barrel. So for example, in this barrel in the top picture, I want my overflow right about here in the very top because you want to capture as much water as possible. And if your overflow is lower on the barrel, you're going to lose that water on the top. You won't be able to capture anything above your overflow. Your overflow does have to drain onto your own property. So if you're using the system like the bottom picture, you already have that downspout going somewhere. So after you divert your 50, 100, or 200 gallons into your system, the rest of the water is gonna go where it was headed anyway. If you do a full divert like that picture we saw before, or this upper picture, you now have all the water from your downspout coming into this barrel. And once the barrel fills, that water has to go somewhere. Legally, it has to go onto your own property. You can't flood your neighbor's side and you can't flood it onto the street. So it's, this is a really good opportunity if you have a rain garden, you can flow it into a rain garden or just some sort of a swale or depressed area. Um, or if you have a French drain, you can feed it into that French drain. Um, I, did I have a few questions on this, Susie? Yes. Um, there are a couple specifically about downspouts. Okay, great. One, yeah. One, and this is a, a longer question, so bear with me. <laughs> uh, currently, our downspouts drain down into an underground pipe, which connects to a dry well about five feet away from the house. We are considering adding a 50-gallon decorative rain barrel at each downspout. After the rain barrel is full, we would like to have the access overflow from the rain barrel go back to the downspout so it can go back to the underground dry well. We haven't found any rain barrels of decorative rain barrels we like that have overflow discharge spout at the top of the barrel. Are there any types of rain barrels you can recommend for this purpose? Yeah, so we're, we're definitely going to talk about different types of rain barrels as we move forward in the presentation. Um, so I would say what you have now is I would consider a French drain and that French drain is where that pipe goes into the ground and into something else or into landscaping, but it's right next to your house. The pipe is going underground and you're not seeing directly where it's going. Um, the best system for you is this bottom picture and this is a basic diverter kit. Um, you can buy them on Amazon for like $35. And they also come with a lot of the basic rain barrels come with this kit already. So depending on which type of barrel you buy, you might find that. So we're going to take a look at those different types of barrels as we move farther into the presentation. 
All right, and then one more regarding downspouts. My house is older and has metal downspouts that are too small to hold the diverters that come with the standard rain barrels. Who can I call to change my downspout? Most contractors want big jobs. If, depending on the type of system you want, if you hire a contractor to do your full installation, they will take care of that for you. Um, you there's also the option you can cut the downspout yourself and you know go to Home Depot and get the parts and you know put a different size downspout on your system. And if you look around, I know the two inch square downspouts are really difficult to find a diverter for. Um, but if you have any any other size, you might be able to find a diverter for it. I will say I've had a lot of trouble in the past with the two inch square ones, which is probably what you're looking at. And that at that point, it might be easiest to do a full divert and then run the run an overflow back into your lines. Great, thanks, Chris. We do have a few more questions, but they're about leaf eaters and pumps and maintenance, gonna which get, you're going to be covering. So awesome. I'll let you talk we're going to talk first. about that now. Let's, yeah. let's get into that. Great. So and I, I did put some you know price ranges for each of these accessories on here because that's a question I get a lot, and you know, that's, it is a price range. I'm sorry, it can't be more specific, but it really depends on the type of system you're putting in. Um, so the question is to first flush or not to first flush. And a first flush diverter works like this. The water comes in the top and it fills up this first flush diverter. And as that water fills up, this ball will float. And when that ball gets to the top, there's a rubber gasket right here. And that rubber gasket and the ball will create a seal. So once that ball floats to the top, all the water coming in will then flow into your barrel. And the idea of that is if you are really concerned about additional pollutants in your system, or if you live in a high dust or high particulate area, this will allow all of, all of that first flush of water, which is usually the dirtiest water, um, to, to get caught in this bottom pipe. And then that pipe will slowly drain away at the bottom before the next storm. And all you need to do is clean it out, you know, after every storm or every couple months to make sure you're not getting too much of that sediment built up in there. If you live in somewhere that it's a low dust area, there's really not a lot of overgrowth, you really don't want to do the maintenance on it, and you're going to be watering with a large hose, an open-ended hose, you're not going to be using a drip irrigation, so you're really not worried about those smaller particulates, you may not need a first flush diverter. Um, you can also just, you know, if you, if you decide that you have it and then you don't want it, you can, you can change your system later um, or put a cap in the inside. It is really an optional system so as i said it's an accessory it's you know the bright pink handbag to go with the dress or you know the tie clip to go with a nice tie do we have a first flush diverter specific question susie no okay um the next accessory we're going to take a look at is the depth gauge so you biggest question is well how much water is in my tank there's many different ways to tell. One is you can just tap on your barrel, you know, tap start at the bottom, work your way up. When it starts to sound hollow, that's the level your water's at. Or you can install this little floating device. And this little thing is, it's just a float on a string. And you set the gauges. So you decide where empty is going to be and where full is going to be on your system. And then that float will float and tell you what percentage you have full. You can also, for a little bit more money, get one with a digital system. So this is great for folks who have a water tank set up in their crawl space or maybe an underground system. These systems are really hard to check the depth on if you've got to crawl down there and actually look at the gauge. So some of them have systems that send a signal and you can put this in your kitchen where you can check it a little bit more easily. And these systems are usually set up as a percentage. So you need to know how many gallons your tank holds, and then it'll tell you what percentage it's at, rather than how many gallons you have. 
The next one we're going to talk about is a leaf eater. Um, there's a couple different styles and they can range from about 30 to $60. These are always going to connect between your downspout and your barrel, so above your barrel. They're really easy to clean. Um, you can see in this picture, this just pops off. You can tap it against the side of your barrel. All the leaf and debris will come off of it and then you just put it back on. You can even use the water in your rain barrel to rinse it out a little bit. It can act as the required screening if your barrel does not have a screen built in. A lot of barrels will already have a screen built in, but not all of them. So this can take that place of that required screening to keep mosquitoes out. So the pump that I usually use is called an on-demand pump. And it's really great if you prefer to use a hose to water your plants, you really don't want to use a drip system, you, you, you want to use a hose. It'll screw directly into the barrel. Um, you can use a quick connect. And if you have a contractor set up, they can set that up for you or you can go to a, a hardware store and find quick connects and set it up. It's really simple to use. If there is water coming into it and a need for water to come out of it, the pump will run. If the, if you have a hose with a handle on it and the handle's turned off and there's water coming in, the pump will turn off. It is a very simple, there's no on off switch for this type pump, it's just on demand. It's the cheapest type of pump that you can use for a rain barrel and about the easiest to use. You just plug it in, hook it to the barrel and you're all set. These are not pumps that are made to be put in the barrel. If you do have like a below ground cistern, which we'll talk about later, you'll get a different type of pump and it'll cost a little bit more, but it's a different setup. And you can also get automatic pumps that are set up on a timer to run an irrigation system, but they need to be more water resistant. This is the more basic style of pump. And I'm happy to answer questions on pumps at the end of the presentation. We are getting short on time and I wanna get through a little bit more. Um, so we already really talked about the drip timers and, you know, drip irrigation, you can set it up for manual or for a drip timer. We really talked about that already. And you really just want to think about how you're going to use your water when you set up your system and your output for your system. Because if you want to use watering cans, then you need to make sure that you have a way to fill those watering cans and your system isn't set up as a closed system like all of all these ones pictured. Actually right here you can see this does have a, a valve to fill watering cans. Um, this is the filter I was talking about. It's a very basic part you can get at Home Depot and this part on the bottom just screws off. The filter, pop, filter pops out. You can use a bottle brush to clean it and then you're all set again and it'll filter out all those really fine particulates. And if you want to run your water into a landscape pond or a dry creek bed, uh, you can, and you really don't need as much filtration. You just use a larger hose to do that, or a larger pipe to set that up, and you can run it out. And the main thing is it's really great to be able to use that water a little bit later when it's not during a rain event to get that water into your garden. Um, so we already kind of talked about the wine barrel conversions. If you're a little bit more hands-on, or if you're gonna hire a contractor to do your installation, Wine barrels are really a great option. You do need to be comfortable with power tools or have a contractor to do it because it's, the holes are not already installed. You're gonna have to create the holes and create the systems. I will be sending out a handout about how to do a wine barrel conversion with the follow-up email. And if you wanna check these out, the one on the left is at Gamble Gardens in Palo Alto and the one on the right is in Cupertino at McClellan Ranch. There are basic rain barrel kits. These are the type of kits that you can get on Amazon, at Lowe's, at Home Depot, any hardware store. Um, oh, I almost said Orchard Supply. <laughs> any, any local Ace Hardware, any hardware store locally. Um, the one on the left is a raindrop box, and this is designed by a local high school student in San Carlos. So that's a little bit more specialized. I'll make sure that that information goes out in the follow-up email as well. Um, these are all generally 50 to 100 gallons. Uh, sometimes you'll find some larger ones depending on the sites, but you can get ones like that blend in with your landscape perfectly like the rock or ones that you can you know, put a plant on top. And there's, there's a lot of different styles. And these kits usually come with everything you need to set it up. So it'll come with the drill bits, it'll come with all the parts, 
everything you need to do the installation, including instructions. If you're really into recycling, which is great, love it, you can do food grade barrels. So on the left, we have some recycled olive oil barrels. These you can find at the Raft Barrel Preserve. We saw the picture in the first earlier slide of the full system finish. On the right, these are blue barrels. Um, both of these systems here are actually daisy chained together. You don't have to daisy chain a food grade barrel. You can do it individually as just one standalone barrel. And you can paint them if you put a base a primer coat on them, you can paint them and have them blend into your garden. But if you decide you want a little higher capacity, you can daisy chain. And daisy chaining is connecting the barrels. So you can see really clearly in this picture from Hoover Park. The water comes in here in the first barrel, and then there's this pipe about um, eight inches up from the bottom of the barrel, and that pipe connects all the barrels. And what you can't see is they're actually connected at the top and the back as well. So as the water goes in and the water starts to fill here, it will fill fairly evenly, if I could draw evenly, on all four barrels. And all four of those barrels will fill simultaneously with water. Should the water come in really, really fast and this half inch pipe on the bottom can't accommodate and the first one fills all the way, there is a backup system on these barrels that they're connected up here at the top as well. So it will overflow into the second barrel cascading down the line. And then that is set up to overflow and to irrigate a rain, the rain garden at Hoover Park in Palo. Um, you can see in this system, we do have that first flush diverter on the left. We do have a leaf heater on the right. So this has some of those extra accessories we talked about, but not all of the extra accessories. Susie, did we have any questions about rain barrels before I move on to cisterns? Yes, I think this one's particularly um, not viewed in the middle here. Um, will it be useful to install only one rain barrel or do we need to install rain barrels on all, all four corners of the house to balance them? It is absolutely a personal choice. So every house is different. Um, I do recommend before choosing your, your rain barrel site, we're actually going to talk about choosing your system after the, the cisterns. But I do really recommend thinking about how you're going to use that water. Because if you want to use that water to irrigate your garden, and your garden's in the northwest corner of your house, you probably don't want to put your rain barrel at the southeast corner of your house. Because it's going to take a lot more effort to get that water over to your garden if it's on the opposite side of the house from your barrels. If you want to use that water, um, on four separate gardens that are all around your house, it might make sense to put a barrel next to each one. Uh, you also wanna take a look at your downspouts during a rain event. And sometimes uh, some of your downspouts will be producing water and others won't. And a lot of that's just the slope of your house and where the rain's hitting, or if you have a tree covering part of your house that's slowing the rain down. Um, it's, you know, you, you're probably, if you're only putting 50 gallons in each one, even if you have less water coming out of one downspout, it'll probably fill all, all of them because we already looked, we're having more than 10,000 gallons worth of water coming off of a thousand square foot roof throughout the year. You know, 50 gallons is just a drop in the bucket there. So you're gonna fill that. So it's really, it's really a usage and a, a personal decision for where you want it. You also wanna think about you know, is this going to block a pathway? Is this going to block an alleyway? Um, will I still be able to walk past these barrels to get to where I need to go? Because you don't want to block your path in any way. Um, thanks. Sorry, Susie, go ahead. As I say, thanks, Chris. We'll, we'll answer these at the end. I also want to acknowledge Mandy. I see your raised hand, and we'll get to you at the end of the presentation as well. Awesome. So. Daisy training is great. You, in this case, at Hoover Park, we have a 220 gallon capacity, which as we mentioned before, over 200 gallons for a single barrel becomes a cistern. So this is giving you the same capacity as a cistern, but using rain barrels. But if you actually wanna go the next step and look at cisterns, there are some different types of options. So above ground cisterns like these, this is a, 
500 gallon Roto Plus barrel that you can see at the Peninsula Conservation Center in Palo Alto. And you can see this is in the process of being installed in this picture. We have a wonderful worker up on a ladder posing for the picture. Um, and the one on the right is the one we already looked at for our anatomy picture at Gamble Gardens as 265 gallons. Both of these are set up to overflow and drain into rain gardens. When you have this much water stored, it's really great to have something planned for it. You, you want to have an idea of where you want to use this water because 500 gallons is a decent amount of water and we want to know where it's going. A lot of people ask me what the life expectancy is on barrels like this. These cisterns, I believe, have a 35-year guarantee with something like a, an 80 or 90-year life expectancy. Like, these are built to last. These are very thick-walled cisterns. They're designed so that, the uh, same with the rain barrels, you're not having any light coming in, so you're not going to be growing anything in, in the barrels. They're designed to be used for rainwater and to store the water and to use the water. Um, when you get into a cistern for the City of Palo Alto's rebate program, you do have to have them installed by a licensed contractor. And that contractor will really go over with you all the specifics for your house. Does it make sense in this location? Is there a better location? Does an above ground cistern make sense? Or maybe a below ground cistern makes more sense for you? And all of those questions, if you are considering a cistern, you're going to go over very specific questions for your own home with your contractor. Um, if you take a look at a, a below ground cistern, you have a lot of the same parts that we had for the rain barrels or the above ground cisterns. You still have that inlet coming from there. You're still going to have a screening or a mesh, both the inlet and the overflow and the outlet. You're going to have that screening. Um, you're going to have a pump that actually is in your below ground cistern. So you can see here you have a pump and this is not going to be that you know $80 pump you looked at before. This is going to be a pump that's that's going to be really built in. It's going to be wired in and your contractor is going to take care of all that. And that pump will be set up to take the water out and wherever you want to use the water. You'll have an access point at the top at the ground level of, of that path and you also have a vent pipe. Those are so that the, you know, the air can vent out as the water fills. If you think about um, a laundry soap container, if you don't pop the top and let the air in, it stops letting the, water, the laundry soap out at the bottom. It's the same idea. It needs to have air in so it can equalize to keep the tank healthy and let the water fill and be used. You're also gonna need to overflow it you're going to want that overflow to run away from your home and if possible into landscaping, but it has to run onto your own property, same as before. You cannot flood your neighbor out with your, with your rain system. Um, so we started to kind of talk about choosing your system and that was a great question. You know, all of these are really personal decisions. So you want to decide you know, what is your harvesting potential? Go through and do the math and see what, what type of barrel or cistern works for you. You wanna decide how many downspouts you wanna hook into the system. Do you wanna hook two separate downspouts into one system? Like this picture here, it's a little hard to see, but there's actually, if we were able to see off the picture, there's actually another downspout coming from a different a different side. So this one comes from two sides of the building and then goes into one set of, of barrels. Or do you want to just have separate barrels at each downspout? How much space do you have to install it? Can I, do I have enough room for a 265 gallon cistern? Do I have enough room for a 500 gallon cistern? Or can I not fit something that big, but maybe I can put four 50 gallon barrels daisy chained together? What space do I have next to my house? Uh, where am I gonna use the water? How am I gonna use the water? These are really important because again, you really don't want your barrel to end up on the opposite side of the house from where you wanna use the water. It's not insurmountable, but it, it'll get frustrating. Um, you really wanna think about your drainage and your overflow. Do you have a place for the water to go, the excess water? If you already have a French drain, you're all set. 
um, if where the water from your downspouts currently going is an issue, you probably want to get that water going somewhere else on your property. If you like where your downspout water is currently going, you're probably going to want to overflow to that same spot. And then you also want to look at your, your personal view, what you think is pretty aesthetically pleasing. You know, if you like the wine barrels or if you really like the way the recycled crude barrels look or if you're an artist and you can take one of those olive oil barrels and paint it like this one in the picture, which makes it look absolutely gorgeous. I do not have the skills to do something like that. So wine barrels are my favorite. Um, just to recap, these are the types of barrels we looked at, and that's all part of choosing your system. So we had those food grade barrels, the wine barrels, the daisy chaining, cisterns, and below ground cisterns, as well as those basic kits. So just, you know, to kind of get you thinking now that you've heard all of them, you know, which one do I like, which one do I think might be right for me. To maintain your barrels, you really want to clean those gutters. Here's a picture in the top right. You can see that clutter is actually growing things at this point because it hadn't been cleaned in so long. You can get gutter scoops, which are a scoop that's specifically designed to scoop out your gutter. Um, there's people who their most of their job is to clean out gutters. You can hire people that'll come do it two to three times a year for you. Um, you can also, you know, get up there on a ladder and do it with a nice pair of gloves like this photo. And, you know, they're all great options just to keep your gutters clean. Uh, really want to do that like twice a year. Um, if you're in an area that really gets a lot of leaf debris on your house during the winter when it is raining, you may want to do it like once a month depending on, you know, how bad your own gut gutters are. Um, this is something even if you don't have a rain barrel, it's good to keep your gutters clean. Um, twice a year, you really want to check and empty your leaf feeder. Uh, like I said, though, I do it when I'm walking to the store to go to the gro go get groceries. I'm walking out my door. I'll look at it. If I see there's stuff on it, it's very easy to just pop the leaf feeder lid off and clean it. Um, just tap it against the side of the building and everything falls off and put it back on. Um, cleaning your first flush diverter if you decide to install it. Really, after the first and the last storm, um, this is about the minimal twice a year. Use your water. You really want to use your water. We're going to talk about that in the next slide, but you can store that water for five years. It's going to be fine. It's, it, it'll have a little bit of an earthy smell to it because it has that little bit of compost in it. Um, ideally, you want to use it every storm, but you know if you forget and, and the water really sits there, it's not a big deal. About every five years, you want to just flush some clean water through your, through your barrels. So this is usually Right about this time of year, as we're getting into October and we're thinking about the next rain events coming up, you want to, your, your barrel's probably already empty, you've used it through this whole dry season, and you just want to take a hose in there, a high pressure hose, and just hose around. You're only going to probably use five, five gallons of water to clean it out, and you're just going to high pressure hose around the whole inside to kind of swish it around. If you have a drip system or irrigation on there, you're gonna disconnect that and just let it drain out through the main thing because this will get all of that um, bigger sediment that you have in your system to be drained out. And you really talked about using your water. It's really important to use your rainwater. Um, you wanna use it regularly and empty your barrels between storms. And this is just so that we can do that slow it, spread it, sink it that we talked about. Because if you leave your rain barrel full and we get another rain, all of that rain goes straight through the overflow. But if you wait, you know, the day before the storm, you empty that water into your garden and let that garden soak it up, then you can capture all new rain for the next storm. Um, you know, we talked about using a pump or doing everything gravity fed. We talked about filling a bird bath or a landscape pond or a dry creek. It's also great for washing tools. Um, you can just water your garden or landscape. If you're going to do drip irrigation, we talked about that extra filter you really want to set up. Um, for a hose or watering can is, is the more basic system where you really don't need a filter. You just hook the hose on and turn open the valve. Um, you can connect it to a toilet for flushing, but you do actually need a permit to do this. And this is something you would have a contractor do for you. 
it's just another use for the rainwater if you have a large enough system that will use your water a lot faster than landscaping will but it's an idea especially if you if you really are invested in getting a larger system it's easier if you're doing a new build for a new house um, but it is possible to have a contractor set that up and you can get a permit to do that um, also just like we said before slow it spread it sink it Hi everyone, I'm Pam Boyle Rodriguez, uh, the Stormwater Compliance Manager for the City of Palo Alto. And, you know, most of today has focused on the actual uh, types of stormwater treatment measures that you can put in that are also covered by a rebate through our rebate program. Uh, we're not going to dig into the details of the rebate program yet. Um, we're going to probably have a separate um, separate workshop that focuses on that, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about it and tell you about our website. Uh, we're working to update our rebate program in general and our website, and uh, partly because we want to uh, kick, it, kick off a new partnership that we have with the Santa Clara Valley Water District or just Valley Water. And as you know, they are a water purveyor for south of East Palo Alto into a lot of Santa Clara County. And we also, because we're at the cusp of also um, sharing San Francisco uh, public utility water, this uh, webinar is part of a separate water purveyor partnership, but this, rate, this stormwater rebate program is with Valley Water. They, have, they offer it to all their customers which means that it's a pretty large area. Uh, we just happen to also have a stormwater rebate program, so we found a way to work together. Uh, and so we wanted to explain that a little bit to you because it might seem complicated in the beginning. We're trying to find uh, a way to streamline it for all the residents and business, business owners and, and workers in the city of Palo Alto. So uh, I am sorry if you did not work or live in Palo Alto, uh, you wouldn't be able to apply to the City of Palo Alto rebate program, but you should still look into the Valley Water rebates. You may be able to apply to one of those. So I wanted to bring your attention to this table on the screen. Uh, you have rain barrels, cisterns, pervious pavement, and rain gardens. And you heard about all these four today. You learned about all the multiple benefits of using any of these. And I wanted to point out that through our partnership, Valley Water and the city will provide rebates to, for rain barrels, cisterns, and rain gardens. This means that whether or not you live in the city of Palo Alto, you can receive a rebate from Valley Water for rain barrel cisterns and rain gardens, but not pervious pavement. Now, you probably already know, we're going to talk about it later, uh, but Valley Water does offer rebates for a lot of other type water saving programs. So uh, you should definitely look into that. Uh, but City of Palo Alto in particular, in addition to these other three, also offers uh, rebates to pervious pavement. Now, if you looked into this program a few months ago, you may know that we weren't offering uh, rebates for rain gardens before July. So that is new for us. Uh, we've also taken green roofs out of our program. Uh, we realized it wasn't a great fit so we're no longer providing rebates for green roofs. So these are the four stormwater treatment measures we now allow. So this is this is actually this table is actually taken from our website, and what you can see is that the total rebate amount is listed for each of these items. And so for the rain barrel, cistern, and rain garden, that total rebate amount includes the rebate that you would receive from Valley Water and from City of Palo Alto. So for rain, the rain barrel, for example, Valley Water provides $35 for each rain barrel. So if you're daisy chaining, that would be for each of those daisy chain rain barrels. And then the city of Palo Alto also offers a rebate of $35 per rain barrel. So um, if you maybe don't have enough room for a cistern, whether above ground or below ground, but you want to try to capture more water than one, one rain barrel, can capture, then you can think about a daisy chain system, or if you can just do one rain barrel, uh, you can apply to that. 
Uh, as you can see, we have a size requirement. So this is criteria that has to be followed, whether you apply for Valley Water or the city. Uh, we define a rain barrel as under two, as between 40 and 199 gallons, and a cistern as of, as 200 gallons and over 200 gallons. And so, you know, certainly the, the bigger the system that you can fit on your yard, the better, obviously, you'll capture more rain. Um, and with rain gardens, we provide a rebate for a dollar per square foot of roof that you can divert to the rain garden. So in, through that application, you will need to, cap, uh, to measure your roof and then uh, we would do it, we would confirm that the size that you submit is the size that would be diverted. Uh, for pervious pavement, it's actually the, the amount of square foot of surface area that you install, you would receive $1.50 for that square foot. So rain barrels, you can install those on your own. You don't need a licensed contractor. As you learned today from Chris, who provided a lot of very helpful information, you could do it on your own. Um, or at least get some friends to help you who are, who are handy and have great tools. Uh, but for cisterns, pervious pavement, and rain gardens, you do need a licensed contractor. So for uh, just, you know, I'm going to go over this quickly. So whether you live in a home or whether you own a business or what, or ask your business to, uh, your, as an employee, to install something, um, each of these, have a lifetime maximum. So the city has lifetime maximums, Valley Water has lifetime maximums. So you can see that for in Palo Alto, for example, if you wanted to install uh, pervious pavement, then you would look at the column under Palo Alto because Valley Water does not provide a rebate for pervious pavement. But if you want to do rain barrels, cisterns, or rain gardens, look at the right where it says well, total lifetime. So you could receive, if you're a resident, up to 3,000. And for, if you're a commercial owner, you could receive up to 55,000. And so, as I mentioned, we're not gonna get into the details about the program today, but I do want to point out that uh, it's really important to read through our website. And you can see the um, city of Palo Alto forward slash stormwater will take you to the city of Palo Alto stormwater rebate program. And there is another website for Valley Water. What we are hoping to do with our city website is make it as clear as possible so that if you go to that website, you will understand how the partnership works and how it would work to apply for a rebate both through the city and Valley Water. Um, so let me point out that if, if you are applying for that rebate through the partnership, that you would apply through the Valley Water um, web website. However, I would say if you want some really detailed information about the program, maybe visit our site first. I just wanted to uh, make it really clear, and I'm sure I have already. So the difference between City of Palo Alto and Valley Water is, um, as you know, uh, City of Palo Alto provides rebates for all of those four stormwater treatment measures, but Valley Water does not provide the previous pavement pavement rebate. Um, please do not install anything or don't even purchase anything till you talk to us first. And then even if you buy something and you've talked to us, don't install anything till you get a notice of proceed from us. And that would be done through an email. Uh, so you can have documentation yourself and that we can have that documentation. So once you get that notice of proceed, then you can get started um, and you will get that information from, from us. Um, the, uh, we, as a city, uh, will be inspecting all your stormwater treatment measures once you install them, and we may uh, provide a pre-inspection, as pre-installation inspection as well, particularly for pervious pavement and the large cisterns. Uh, you would not receive an inspection from Valley Water staff unless you choose to use their program rebates and you want to change your lawn to uh, do you want to remove your lawn and put in some native and drought tolerant plants? And while you're doing that, maybe you can put in a rain barrel or a cistern. Then if that's the case, then they'll visit you. But otherwise, if you're just putting in one of these stormwater treatment measures, you won't get a visit from Valley Water, but you can definitely get a visit from us, uh, which is, which is um, 
a great um, experience for you because then you can ask us for help in the, uh, when we visit your home and we can provide a bit more guidance. Um, you'll definitely need a city permit for most things except rain barrels, um, although there is criteria that you need to follow um, in, in terms of how much distance should be between your home and whatever treatment measure you put in, et cetera. You'll see that on the website. And we won't be able to go into this too much, but I just wanted to bring attention that Valley Water has a lot of different rebate programs to help you save water both indoor and outdoor. And a lot of that is also through a partnership with the City of Palo Alto Utilities. So there are a lot of really great rebates that you should look into. Um, in particular, our program just works with their, what they call their rainwater capture program. And that's where we partner on the, on the three stormwater treatment measures that I mentioned. There we go, thank you. All right, 